Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the August edition of Nigeria Power BI Professionals uh, Power BI webinar. So this is 1st of September, but we are meant to do this in August. We missed one in July, which we think we should be able to bring back sometime in September. So we are hoping that this September we will run at least three webinars this September. So this is going to be the first one, and this is for the August edition. And today we are going to be looking at something on uh, data modeling in Power BI. But well, before that, let me introduce myself. So my name is Ahmed Oyelo, and I'm a Microsoft Certified Solutions Associate for BI Reporting. So this is something I always advocate that every one of us should endeavor to get. It is very easy for you to be certified as an MCSA. So with your Power BI knowledge, you can write a couple of exams that will enable you to end this certification, MCSA BI reporting. I'm also a Microsoft Certified Trainer, MCT, and a Certified Advanced Financial Modeler. I train a couple of courses on Power BI, Power Query, Financial Modeling, Advanced Data Analysis and Reconciliation, as well as Data Presentation. So I'll be your, your guide for this webinar. So what are we going to learn in this webinar, which I hope is not going to take us more than one hour. So we'll learn how to build a Power BI data model. So that is the, the main subject for this webinar. And in this webinar, we'll be understanding what a Power BI data model is and why we really need one. Is there a need for a data model or should we just connect to a data set and continue to build our data analysis on that? Then we'll understand what a fact and dimension table means. So these are terms in data modeling. So we'll get to understand what these terms really mean. So if you start to watch some uh, videos on YouTube or you are trying to follow some Power BI book something, you will be hearing about fact and dimensions a lot. So we'll understand what fact means and what dimension tables also mean. Then how to identify what field should we have in our fact table and what fields should we have in our dimension tables? How do you even build a fact and dimension tables with Power Query? So at the end of the day, you now understand what a data model is, but then how do you build your fact and dimension tables using Power Query? It's something that is very easy, so we'll see how to do that. And we'll also learn how to build a calendar table with DAX. So building a Power BI data model. First of all, what do we understand by a data model and why do we even need it at all? So a data model is simply when you organize your data tables, your data into various tables based on groupings and relationships. And the main reason why you are doing this is to reduce redundancy and optimize efficiency. In a short while, I'll be sharing a screen with you to explain what this really means in details. But just have it at the back of your mind that when you are building a data model, what you are simply doing is you will have multiple tables. So even if your data source is a single table, you should be expected to break it down into multiple tables based on groupings and relationships that exist within that data. And you are doing this simply to reduce redundancy and to optimize efficiency of your Power BI file or whatever you are publishing. So I'm going to be looking at steps that you need to take to build a Power BI data model. So we have said that a Power BI data model is basically splitting your table into various tables. And what you are going to be splitting into is basically two types of tables. And these two types of tables are called the fact tables and the dimension tables. But before I go into the steps into breaking this down, I would like to share a separate screen with you where I will be showing you what we are trying to explain. So if you take a look at this data set, this is basically a data set that has to do with an e-commerce business where you order a couple of products and you get it shipped to wherever your location is. So on this data set, we have about 9,994 rows of data, and we have uh, 21 columns. So 9,994 rows and 21 columns. So if I do a simple multiplication, 
is going to be equal to 9994 multiplied by 21. So we have 209,874 items on this data. Items meaning cells in Excel terms, basically. So what that means is if I start counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all the way to the right and all the way to the last data at the bottom of this screen, that means I'm going to be having 209,874 items. Now, we are going to split this one big table into two different kinds of tables for data modeling. And these two types of tables are your fact table and your dimension tables. Why are we doing this again? We are doing this because we would like to reduce redundancy on this data. Basically, we would like to eliminate redundancy so that we can optimize efficiency. Okay? So right now, we have 21 columns and we have 9,994 rows. But if we take a careful look at this data, you realize something. So if I come over to the right-hand side, where I have country, city, state, postal code, and region. So these are one, two, three, four, five different columns, right? And if you take a look at the country column alone, you realize that the only thing you have on this country column all the way down is United States. Only United States is occupying this column. You agree with me that that is redundant because if we eliminate this column from this data table, it's not going to affect our result or our analysis in any impactful way. So there won't be any effect, a negative effect on this if we remove this. So looking at these five columns once again, you can agree with me that if you have a poster code, for example, so if you have a poster code 42420, from there you'll be able to get which particular city that poster code belongs to. You can also identify which states, you can identify which region, and ultimately you can identify which country. Meaning that, why do we need to keep country, city, state, and region on this table, knowing fully well that just the postal code can give us what we want. It's more or less like saying, if you are looking at a calendar, let's say you have a data set that has dates. So assuming you have dates here, for example, just imagine that on this, your table, you now have to add additional columns like this. So this is 08-11-2016, and you are now saying something like month, and you put in November, then you come here, you put quarter, and you put in third quarter. You come here, you put year, and you put in 2016. You agree that this is all irrelevant. This is irrelevant because this date alone can identify the month, it can identify the quarter, and it can identify the year. So we don't need to keep separate columns to keep all these extra ones. So the same way, if you have something like this, where you have country, city, state, postal code, and region, if you have a postal code, there is ultimately no need for you to keep country, city, state, and region. Why? Because from this postal code alone, you can get to all of these columns. Now, keeping all of this simply means you are keeping 9,994 times 2, 3, and 4. So that means if we're able to eliminate this four alone, we would have been able to eliminate equals to 9994 multiplied by four columns. So we'd have eliminated 39,976 items from this table, which will make our file much lighter and which will also optimize the efficiency of our data model. So that is the reason why we need to build a data model. More or less, one of the reasons why we need to build a data model. So we are going to eliminate redundancy. So keep this number in mind, 209874. Keep that number in mind. I will just record it somewhere. So 209874. That is the number we are working against now. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to that steps of how to build a Power BI data model. 
So when you are building a Power BI data model, you want to split your tables into two different kinds, fact tables and dimension tables. The first step is basically to separate your reporting fields. So fields, we are coming from Excel background, what we know as column in Excel is the same thing as fields. So we are separating our reporting fields into two different types of data, categorical data and quantitative data, which is categories and values. That is step one. You have to separate your reporting fields into categories and values. Step two, is to consider all your value fields as fact table fields. So after separating into categories and values, you are going to consider all those your value fields or quantitative fields that you have within your data. You consider those ones as your fact table fields, step two. Then step three, having considered all value fields as fact table fields, you are now left with your categorical fields, right? So those categorical fields, you are going to have to take a careful look at each of those fields so that you can identify if it is related with any other field within your data. So you are basically trying to look for hierarchies, like a parent-child kind of hierarchy. So when you think about this, you are thinking about something that looks like a family tree, whereby at the top you have something like great-great-great-grandfather, then Below that, you have great-great-grandfather, then you have a grandfather, then you have a father, then you have children. So that is like a family tree. This is something you'll be looking out for in your data. So you look at each of the fields and try to figure out if in any way it has a relationship with any other field within that table. That is you looking for hierarchies. So when you do that, then you should now consider all of those categorical fields that doesn't have any relationship with any other, any other field. You will take those as fact table fields. Why those ones that have relationship with other columns, you will take those as dimension tables. I'm gonna show you what this is all about. Then step four, after step three, you have dimension tables already, and you have your fact tables already. So you have fields that make up dimension, and you have fields that make up your fact table. So step four is now for you to identify what is the smallest unit within each of those dimensions. So the smallest unit within each of the dimensions, like the family tree I talked about, the smallest unit is gonna be the last child that doesn't have a child, basically. So the last child that doesn't have a child will be the smallest. So the great, great, great grandfather has given birth to the great, great grandfather. The great, great grandfather has given birth to the grandfather. The grandfather has the father as a child. Then the father has children. It's only the children that are yet to have other children. So those children are now going to be your primary kid because they are the smallest unit within your dimension. Then step five is for you to now replicate all those primary keys that you have on the dimension. You are going to replicate it on the fact table. So basically, at the end of the day, what you end up having in your fact table is you have all your value fields are going to be in your fact table. That is number one. Number two, all the categorical fields that don't have any hierarchies are going to be in your fact table. Then number three, all the primary keys within your dimensions are going to be on your fact table as well. So how do we do this? If we take this one after the other, step one is for us to have all our fields. So these are basically all the fields that we have within that data. So we have something on row ID, order ID, and all of this. Then the next thing is, we are trying to split this into two different kinds of tables like we mentioned on step one. We want to split them into categorical fields. So we want to identify a row ID. Is it quantitative or is it qualitative, basically? That is when we are splitting it into categorical fields and value fields. So is row ID quantitative or is it qualitative? So the contents, what does it say on this data? So if it is qualitative, then it's going to be categorical. If it is quantitative, then it is going to be values. So row ID content 
is categorical. Other ID is basically what we use to identify each other. It is also categorical. Other date is telling us when was that order made. It is categorical. Ship date is something to tell us when was that order shipped. It is categorical. Ship mode is what type of mode are we using to ship this product that the person has ordered. It is categorical. Customer ID, categorical. Customer name and customer segment are also categorical. Country, city, state, postal code, region, product ID. Category is also categorical. Subcategory is categorical. Product name is categorical. Why sales is the sales value. So basically, sales is values. Quantity is values. Discount is values. And profit is also values. So now that we have identified what it is, what each of these fields are in our data, we know which fields are qualitative and we know which fields are quantitative. So these guys are our quantitative fields and these guys are our qualitative fields. So we have satisfied step one of building our data model. So step two now says that we should consider all the value fields. These guys around here, we need to consider them as our fact table field. So all these guys, sales, quantity, discount, and profit are going to appear in our fact table. That is step two. So step one, we are splitting each of these fields into either categorical field or values field. Step two, we are considering all our value fields as fact table fields. Step three, is when we go to look at each of these categories and we are trying to find out if it has any relationship with any other column. Does it have any kind of parent-child hierarchical relationship with any column? So row ID, we'll consider this first. Row ID, is it in any way related to, does it have any natural relationship with all of these columns? So when we, have, when we say natural relationship, we mean something like when you look at a calendar, for example, a calendar is a typical example. So on a calendar, a natural relationship on a calendar is basically from day you have weeks. So a couple of days is going to make up a week. A couple of weeks is going to make up a month. And then a couple of months is going to make up a year. And if you take it a step further, a couple of years is going to give you a decade. And a couple of decades is going to give you a century. So that is what we mean by natural relationship, okay? So row ID basically doesn't have any natural relationship with any other column. So we are going to consider it in our facts table. So it will form part of the columns that will go to fact. Other ID doesn't have any relationship with any other column. So other ID will also go into the facts table. Other dates, We'll go into the fact table. Ship dates, we we'll go to fact. Ship mode, we we'll go to fact. Then we we'll come to this customer ID. So we have customer ID. Does it have any natural relationship with any other column? So if you look through, you will see that customer ID flows with customer name. And that also flows with segment. So this segment is basically a customer segment. So customers usually have segments. Is it a corporate customer? Is it a retail customer? Or is it a corporate customer? Whatever it is. So customer ID, customer name, and segment have a relationship. So these three are going to go into a table called dimension table. So we are going to create a dimension table called maybe a D customer dimension for customer, dimension for customer, dimension for customer. So these three are going to go into a dimension table. Then we move on to country. So we have country. Does it have any natural relationship with any other column? Going up, it doesn't have, but going downwards, it does have. So country, on that country, you are going to have a couple of cities. A couple of cities is going to make up a state. And then you have a postal code and you have region. So these are all location data. So they form a hierarchy for location. So from country, city, state, postal code, and region are going to go into a dimension table for location. So country, city, state, 
postal code and region are going to go into a dimension for location. Then we have product ID. So product ID, does it have any natural relationship with any other column here? Yes, we think it does. So product ID is related to product category. So every product has its category. And then every product also has subcategory. So a category is more or less like great great grandfather subcategory is like grandfather then you have a product name which is like a child right so product id category subcategory and product name are going to go into a, a dimension for product because they have a relationship so this completes steps one two three so on step one we're able to classify each of these fields into categorical fields or value fields. On step two, we are able to identify all our value fields as fields that are going to go into our facts table. On step three, we took a look at each of these categorical fields and we are trying to find out if it is in any way related to any other column. In which case, if it does have that relationship, we are saying it should go into a dimension table, but if it doesn't have that relationship, it should go into the fact table. So every categorical field that is standing alone is going to fact table, while every categorical field that has a hierarchy of relationships with others is going into a separate dimension table. Okay, so now we have our dimension tables, and uh, these are the three dimension tables that we now have. We have a customer table here, then we'll have a location table here, and we'll have a product table here. So on the customer's table, we have all the fields that form the hierarchy of customers, these three columns. On location field, we have all the fields that form that hierarchy for locations, country, city, state, postal code, and region. And on product table, we are going to have all the fields that form a hierarchy in product. So these are the three dimension tables that we'll have based on this data. Then we'll have our fact table. Remember, your fact table is going to contain all the quantitative fields within your data plus all those fields, all those categorical fields that doesn't have any hierarchies with any other column, right? So these are your dimension tables and these are your fact tables. And this completes steps one to three. So step four now says we need to go into each of these dimension tables one after the other this table, this table, and this table, and identify what is the smallest unit within each of these dimensions. So I'll allow you to check through this, and I would like you to type in the chat, uh, in the chat area, can you tell me what is the smallest unit within this dimension of customers? So just type in the chat area. So most people say postal code, but I'm asking about the customer's table now. So on the customer's table, what is the smallest unit on the customer's table? So on customer's table, we have just three, customer ID, customer name, and segments. That is the three we have on customer's table. So what is the smallest on this table? So the smallest on this table really can either be the customer ID or the customer name, but it's safe for us to say it is a customer ID. Why? Because you can have two customers having the same name. So if you've been to Ninja State before, then you will know that we have over 100,000 people bearing Yahya Muhammad. That is a very, very common name in Ninja State, Yahya Muhammad. 
so common. So two customers can have the same name, but two customers can have the same customer ID. So we'll agree that customer ID is the smallest unit on this table. So that is going to be our primary key for customer ID. For customer's table, customer ID will be the primary key. Then for our location table, poster code will be the primary key. I would like to know if anybody disagrees with this. So now I want you to answer for the location table and the product table. So I've said poster code is the smallest unit on location and product ID is the smallest unit on product. So am I right or wrong? Right or wrong? So everybody says right. I need one person to tell me I'm wrong. Or else we are all going to be wrong. So somebody should tell me I'm wrong and tell me what is the right answer. Or else everybody's going to be wrong. I'm sure you are all pretty sure that you are right. But we'll find out if we are right or not. So naturally looking at this based on the steps that we have gone through, it is very easy for us to say poster code is the smallest on location and product ID is the smallest on product. So what is smallest basically means is there is no way a child is going to have two fathers. Is that possible? A child cannot have two fathers. So a child must be identified with only one father. That's what it means. And that's what we call the smallest unit. So if you look at something like states, so many states are going to make up a region, right? So many states will make up a region. So many regions will make up a country. The same way on customer table. One segment alone is going to make up more than one customer. So it is safe for us to say, so many customers are going to make up a segment. So the smallest units we are looking at is a unit whereby you can't go down any further. So on that unit, the only thing you see is the unit. So if you are going down further, you won't find anything. You can't dig deeper than that, right? But we'll find out if we are right or not by the time we view this on Power BI. So now that we have identified this is step four now. So step four is identifying the smallest unit from each dimension, which we have now rightly done. Then step five is for us to repeat each of these units on the fact table. So on the fact table right now, we have all of these. But if you look at this fact table, you will see that we don't have country there. We don't have state and we don't have city, right? We don't have customer name. We don't have customer segments, which means if we are going to report by country, remember the sales value is here. So if we want to do something like sales by country, it's going to be impossible for us to do sales by country because there is no country on this table. There is no country here. So we can't do sales by country. For us to be able to do sales by country or to do sales by segment, which is not here, or to do sales by category or subcategory, which is not here, we need to bring in all these primary keys from each of these dimension tables. We need to bring it into the fact table. So by the time we bring those guys into this fact table, they are going to serve as foreign keys. Now, when we bring these guys in, we can easily create a relationship between the fact table and the dimension tables. So we create this relationship with the keys, right? So we have a primary key here and we have the foreign key here, foreign key rather. So these two guys, once they are connected, remember if I have the poster code, I would expect to be able to tell which region, which state, which city and which country. 
So creating this connection is going to allow me to be able to do other reporting based on the fields that are not here, right? So create a relationship between customer ID on the customer's table and customer ID on the facts table. Going by this, I can now do a reporting that can give me something by segment. Remember, so many customers are making up the segment. So if I can get access to the customer ID, the customer ID already has a name and it has a segment we have classified the customer as. So based on this relationship, I can easily do reporting by customer name and segment. The same way, product ID. By the time I link product ID from my fact table, which is a foreign key here, to the product ID on the dimension table with the primary key. Now I can report something on category because product IDs is going to scale up to give me a product ID is going to go up to give me a particular category or subcategory of product name. So this is going to complete your steps for building a Power BI data model. Now it is very important that you need to do this on paper before you move into Power BI. And the reason why you need to do this on paper is simply because when you do this, two things is going to happen. One is it will enable you to have something like a master plan. So this is more or less like a master plan of what you want to translate into your Power BI model. And the second reason which I find more important is this allows you to understand your data better. So looking at this now, if you have to work with a client's data, for example, so if you are working with your own data, you most likely understand all those relationships. But if you are working with a client's data, that's someone else's data, this will help you a lot in understanding the person's data set. So now that we have completed all these guys, let's see how we'll be able to translate this into a Power BI. So we'll see how can we build this breakup, this old breakup fact dimension and all of this, how can we break it down in Power Query? So I'm gonna share a separate screen now with uh, a Power BI file. So this is now the same data set on Excel that we have brought into Power BI. So let me know if you can see my Power BI screen. So just type yes on the chat area. So I'll be sure you can see this screen. Okay. So everybody can see my Power BI screen, okay? So right now, there's something you always need to understand when you're working in Power BI. So I hope you can see my entire screen anyway. So if you are working with Power BI, when you go to the query editor, you always have two screens. So if I come to my Power BI icon at the bottom of my screen, I can see that I have two windows. So there is a Power BI desktop, which is this. So if I come to, edit queries or get data, anything external data group here is going to open a separate window for me for the query editor. So this is the query editor. Right now I have that data set brought in now and I'll just do a couple of mini transformations on this data to be sure everything is fine. So we are trying to translate all that plan from paper. We are trying to translate it to Power BI. So at the end of the day, if you remember, we are supposed to have three dimension tables and one fact table coming out from this one very big table that has 9,994 rows and 21 columns. So we are going to split this into four different tables. So on the left-hand side of my screen, I have queries. Right now, I have just one, one big table, which I'm going to split into four. So at the end of the day, I'm expected to see four queries here instead of one. So the first thing is the minimum transformation you always need to do, you should note this. So the minimum transformation you must do on your data at the worst case 
is you must ensure that each of your columns that you have there, each of these columns have the correct data type. In our last class, we talked about this when we talked about data preparation and how do we find out what that type is. So if I click on my transform tab, I will see a button for data type that tells me that this selected column is a whole number. If I select another column, other ID, it will tell me that this selected column is a text. But a quick way for you to know what your data type is, is by looking at the little icon beside each of these column headers. So when you see one, two, three, you know you are looking at a whole number column. When you see ABC, you know you are looking at a text column. And when you see this little calendar here, you know you, you are looking at a date column, right? And you can change your types or your column types either from the transform tab by using this icon, this uh, button rather, to change to any of the types you want, or you can right click on the particular column, then you select the change type option and pick whichever one you would like to apply, or you can simply click on little icon beside the column header to quickly pick. So whatever you are going to use is going to depend on what steps you are trying to carry. So for example, if I want to change only one single column type, the easiest way for me to do that is to use this little icon here to select. So this is way faster than either coming here or right clicking, right? But if I want to change multiple columns at the same time, so say I want to change all of these columns, it is easier for me to select those columns at once then right click and use the change type option. Okay, so now I will just confirm if these columns are in the correct data type. So row ID is currently whole number. So the question I will ask myself, is this correct? And the answer is no. So row ID is not supposed to have a whole number, but I'll ask myself a second question. Is this column relevant for any reporting? The answer is simply no. So I will just right click and remove this column. This is not relevant for any of my reporting needs. So I've removed that row ID. Then I will scroll to the left to try to identify if each of these columns have the correct data type. So one column I would like to change is my poster code. So poster code column, I'm going to change this from whole number. I'll change it to text. So you should probably watch our last video on data preparation for reasons why we are doing this. So I've changed this poster code, I've changed it to text. So if I scroll over to the right hand side, everything seems fine. 1.2 tells me that this is a, this is a decimal number. 1.2 tells me decimal number, while 1 to 3 tells me that it is a whole number. So now that I've carried out all these transformations, this is one very big table that I would like to create three more tables from it. So I will just right click on this query and duplicate. Second table, duplicate my third table, duplicate and my final table, okay? So this is gonna be my fact table. All that is gonna be my fact table. So let me use orders two as my customer table. So I can either come to the properties here and rename this as customer table, or I can double click here and rename this. Or another way I can do this is to right click and rename. And like I said, you always use the fastest method and the easiest method for you to get through. So there are always multiple ways for you to skin a cat. So I'll just double click and change this to customers. Then I'll change this to, let me call this location. And this final one, I'll call this product. I'm gonna work from the bottom up. So on the product table, what do we have on our product table? So on the product table, we have product ID, category, subcategory, and product name. So that is the only thing I need to have on this product table. I need to have only product ID, category, subcategory, and product name. So I need to keep only these four. 
Now, what do I need to do if I'm going to keep only these four? It means I need to remove every other column apart from these four. So multiple ways to skin a cat. I can start removing these columns one after the other. Right click, remove, right click, remove. Or maybe I'll select plenty of them at the same time. Maybe I'll select plenty of them at the same time. Then I'll right click and say remove columns. Or maybe I would just select those columns I need alone. So product ID all the way to product name. So if I select the first one, since they are serially arranged this way, I can just hold my shift key and select the last one. So select everything at once. Then I can right click and this time select remove other columns. So that is another way. So select the columns I need and remove the columns I don't need, which is way shorter than removing all the columns I don't need. Since what I need is smaller than what I don't need, it makes sense for me to select what I need and ask Power Query to remove the other ones. But still, I won't go with that method. So the method I would rather go with is if I come to the Home tab, I'm going to select Choose Columns. So under this group for Manage Columns, you have an option to choose the columns you want. So I will select Choose Columns. Then I'll have a dialog box. So on this dialog box, I will just unselect everything and I'll easily pick what I want. So I want to pick product ID, category, subcategory, and product name. So these are the four tables. These are the four columns that I should have on my product table. Then I'll click OK. And I'm left with these four columns. But then this is still 9,994 rows. It is still keeping redundant data. So this is all the products we have in this organization. Each product ID already has a name. Each product ID already has a category and it already has a subcategory. But this is coming from my main transaction data. So if I want to keep a master list of all my products, what I simply need to do is make sure I don't have duplicates. Remember, this is coming from my transaction table here, where we have different transactions for different dates, going all the way to 9,994 rows. And per adventure, maybe it's just 20 products I have, right? So if I have only 20 products, so I should just keep a master list of all my products. So now I'm going to select one of these columns. I'll press Ctrl A on my keyboard to select all columns at once. Then I'll right click and select remove duplicates. So once I remove duplicates, this is supposed to be a master list of all my products based on the hierarchies and based on the groupings that we did on building that data model on paper. So I'll go to my location table now and repeat the same thing on products for location. So the first thing is, what do I have on my product table? So my product table, I mean on my location table, I have country, city, state, postal code, and region. That is one, two, three, four, five columns. Country, city, state, postal code, and region. So on the home tab, I'm going to select choose columns. Then I want to unselect everything and pick what I want. And what I want is country, city, state, postal code, and region. Then I'll hit OK. These are the five columns. I'll select the first one, press Ctrl A, right click, and remove duplicates. So this is a master list of my location. Master list for location. So if you are if you have an organization, for example, where you have branches, so on your main transactional table, you are going to be having everything concerning that transaction, including all details of the location. But then in our fact table, we are going to eliminate everything except the key that leads us to the remaining columns. Right? So once we remove duplicates here, we have a master list of all our locations. Then I'll go to the customers table and go to the home tab, choose columns. On choose columns, I will select everything 
Then I'll pick customer ID, customer name, and segment. Click OK. Select one of the columns. Press Ctrl A to select all. Right click and remove duplicates. So this is now a master list of all my customers and I'm done with creating my dimension tables. So what I need to create now is my facts table. So this is my fact table, which is the orders table. And remember on the orders table, which is my facts, row ID we have eliminated. We need to keep order ID. So I'll come to my home tab, go to choose columns, uncheck everything. I want to keep order ID. I need to keep order dates. So I'll check order dates. I need to keep ship date, ship mode. So I'll keep ship date and ship mode. I need to keep sales quantity discount and profit. So I need to keep sales quantity discount and profit. Then I need to repeat the primary keys, which are customer ID, poster code, and product ID. So customer ID, poster code, and product ID. So this is what is going to go into my fact table. So from 20 columns here in the fact table, which is 20 times 9994, I'm going to be reducing this now to 11 columns which is 11 times 9994. So I've basically eliminated 10 whole columns from this table. So the final thing you now need to do is, now on your fact table, you are not going to remove duplicates. So you're only removing duplicates on dimension tables because they are like master lists. So they are basically lookup tables. While your fact table is keeping all your transactions, so you are not removing duplicates from fact table. Once you remove duplicates from fact table, you have lost data. So you don't want to do that. So lastly, I'm, com I'm coming back to my home tab and I'll hit close and apply. So why this is loading, I want you to think about this. So now that we have created our fact tables and we have created our dimension tables, the next thing we need to do is to create that join between the fact tables and the dimension tables. And you know what we are going to use to do that? Using those keys, primary key to foreign key, primary key to foreign key. So if I come to my model view now in Power BI, you will see that my customer's table has been correctly linked to my orders table using the customer ID. So the customer ID, which was our uh, key here, this is the primary key, this is the primary key, has been correctly linked on Power BI. What has not been linked is my location table as well as my product table. So when you load your data, depending on, your, on the settings on your Power BI, it is possible for it to automatically detect relationships. So now it is smart enough to detect this relationship. How come it's unable to detect the relationship to location and product? So maybe we need to manually create that, right? Okay, so let's see. If we are going to create this manually, that means we need to create a relationship between poster code on location to poster code on our fact table, then product ID on product to product ID on our fact table. So let's try that. So poster code, poster code. So if I create a line just by dragging from dragging this poster code out here and placing it on this poster code here. I should get this line. Naturally, that is what I expect. But if I do this, guess what happens? I have an error. So this relationship has cardinality, many to many, blah, 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 blah. So what this is basically saying is this. Selecting poster code as our smallest unit is wrong. Because the smallest unit is meant to be a unit whereby you can't 
a child should not have two fathers. That is basically what it means. A child should not have two fathers. Think about it like that, which means if you see anything like, uh, let's say, Marina. If you see Marina, then you should be able to tell that Marina is in Lagos. On no equation should you record Marina and find another Marina in Ibadan or Abuja. That means something is wrong. Marina cannot be your smallest unit in that case. Okay, so we need to trace this error. We need to trace this error, but if we think about it, we think we are absolutely right. Postal code is very small. It should be the smallest unit. So what is wrong? So we have to trace this error. So the same thing happens on the product table. So we have said product ID is the smallest unit, which naturally should be. So if I drag product ID from here and I place it on this product ID, I'll basically have the same error. So we have a problem on our hands and this is always, always very common. So we need to know how do we treat this kind of problem. So what I'll do is I'll go back to my edit query and trying to find out why. So the smallest unit is always unique, which means it can only trace, it's more or less like a key or a door, basically. So a key should only open one door, right? A key should only open one door. So the smallest unit is a key, and it's meant to open just one door. So when it is opening two doors, then there is a problem. That means it is, not, it is no longer unique. So if I come to my location table, we said poster code is the smallest and it should be unique. Let's find out what is happening. So if I want to see this, I can use Power Query to help me detect this, whether it is unique or not. So I'll select the poster code column. On the home tab, I will come to this button for keep rows. So if I click on the drop down for keep rows, I will select keep duplicate. So if there is no duplicate, then it will tell me no duplicates, empty table. But if there's a duplicate, it will keep all those duplicates for me. So I'll click on clip duplicate. And you can see that I have an extra step here, right? So keep duplicates. The poster code 92024 is giving me California as a state, but it's also giving me two different cities. So this same poster code is the same for two different cities. One child has many fathers or one key opening different doors. So this is not unique and we can use this to create that relationship. And this is also really common in real life. So think about it. So if you have to create a table, maybe you have a data set coming from various countries in the world. And that data set has locations up to the city level. So you think about it, in your data you have Nigeria, you have Brazil, and you have Portugal. Which means you also have cities for Nigeria, Brazil, and Portugal. And somewhere in that your data, you have Lagos. So at the end of the day, if Lagos, which is a city, is the smallest unit within that data set, and you create a dimension for locations, you will have a problem using city as your unique key, as your primary key. Because now the same Lagos is also in Brazil, the same Lagos is in Portugal, and the same Lagos is in Nigeria. So naturally, what you need to do is, since it is the smallest unit that you think it should be naturally, so the next thing you need to do is go for the second smallest unit and join the two together. So that will create a unique column for you. So instead of using ordinary Lagos as your key, if you combine the Lagos and the country together, then you have a unique key. So instead of Lagos, 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 identifying three different countries, you can have Lagos, Nigeria, Lagos, Brazil, and Lagos, Portugal as a unique keys. And that will make sense because there can only be one Lagos, Nigeria in Nigeria. But Lagos alone can be in two other countries at least. Okay? So I'm just going to delete this last step, kept duplicates, because I only use this to investigate why we have that duplicate. So I'll delete this step. 
and I will try to create a join between this poster code and city. So I will just select poster code first. Then I'll hold my control key and select city. Then I'm gonna click on the add column tab. So really there are multiple ways for you to merge columns, but they all have different implications. So naturally if I select these two like this, and I right click here, then I select merge columns, because naturally anytime you are doing an operation on a column, the best bet for you to find the transformation you need is to right click. But the problem is this, when I right click like this, by selecting the two columns I need and I click merge columns, it's going to eliminate the original columns and just give me one new column that's the combination of the two. I don't want to do that. Remember at the end of the day, I still want to report by city, not necessarily a join of the two, right? So I, was, I won't use this option. So the option I will use is select poster code, hold control, select city, then I'll come to the add column tab and I'll select this merge columns, right? So come to the add column tab and select merge columns. My separator, I can use a comma as separator and the new column name, I will just call this location key. So location key, I'll hit okay. Then I have an extra column that is a combination of CT and poster code. Now in Power Query, the order in which you select those two really matters. So if you had selected city first before poster code, the join I will have is city comma poster code. But selecting poster code first before city is gonna give me poster code comma city. So now that this is my key now that I will use, remember I need to repeat this same key on the fact table. But let me hold on to that first. But I know I have something to do on the fact table. I need to create a location key on fact table. So I keep that in my left hand. Then I'll go to the product table. Now it may seem funny that a single product ID should have a different name. But in reality, this is very, very possible. Now a case of a pharmaceutical company, for example, where they have their product IDs, which is basically for each of the drugs that they make, it is possible that a particular drug with a particular product ID has been given to a separate company to manufacture. So it retains the same product ID, but the name changes, right? So there are real life, real life scenarios like that where the ID is gonna remain the same, but the name is going to change. So that is possible in real life. Same ID, but different names, okay? So in this case, it is very similar to what we had in location. So all we need to do is join product ID and product name to create a unique key. So I'm gonna select product ID column, hold my control key and select product name. I'll make sure I click the add column tab, then I'll select merge columns. So my separator is comma, and this I'll call product key. Click OK. I need to repeat these two steps on the fact table. So I'm gonna come back to my fact table, which is the orders. Now I have poster code, which I need to join with city. Unfortunately, I have removed city. I have product ID, which I need to join with product name. Unfortunately, I have removed product name. So what do I need to do? I need to reverse that step, right? So typically, you want to think about deleting this step outrightly and then reselecting the actual things you need. But that will not be good for you to do that. So what you need to do is, on the apply steps area, I have a small gear icon here that can enable me to edit that step. So once I click on that gear, it will give me the same dialog box. So what I need to do now is bring back CT and bring back product name, then click OK. So now I have CT and I have poster code. 
So instead of keeping city or postal code, what I need to keep is a key, right? So I need to join these two together. So this time around, I will use the second option of joining, which is select the postal code, hold control and select city. Rather than coming to the add column tab, I will just right click here and then select merge columns. My server is comma, it has to be the same thing with the other one. Then I'll call this my location key. I'll click OK. So that's primary key is going to replace my city and location. So what I now have is a location key instead of city and location. So I'll do the same thing for product ID and product name. So select product ID, hold control and select product name. Right click, then match columns. My separator is a comma, and I'll call this product key. So when I hit OK, I have just one column that is a result of the join of the product ID and the product name. Then I can go back to my home tab, close and apply. So now you can see that detection is now finally working. So to confirm what you are actually connecting to, you have to click on the line. So if I click on this line, it will show me that customer ID is connecting to customer ID, which is correct. Click on this line, location key is, is connecting to location key, correct. Then product key is connecting to product key. So the last thing you need to do is you have to test this. So the fact that you are seeing these lines connecting these tables doesn't mean that everything is right. So you have to test this by going to your report view. So if I come to my report view now, I will need to create a report that has a column on the customer's table that doesn't exist on the other table. That is just to tell me that the relationship is actually working. So I'll just use a simple table here. And then I'm going to bring segments. And then I'll go to my orders table and I'll bring in sales. I'll just increase the size. So if this works correctly, if I'm able to get different sales amounts for different segments, that means I have created a valid connection, right? So I'll do the same thing for another field from location and another field for product. So I'll just select this report, control C, control V, drag this one out. Then I'll replace this segment here. I'm going to replace that with something from location. Let me bring in region. If I'm able to get different sales amounts for different regions, that means that connection is correct. Control V. And I need to do the same thing for the products table. So remove segment here and replace it with category. So now this is all correct. And we have a working data model. Now let's quickly confirm something. Can anyone remember the number of items you said we had from the original table? Let me see who has a very sharp memory. Can anybody remember? Just type in the comment box. Anybody? How many items did we have from the single large table at inception? Can anybody remember? 
any sharp memory here, 14,000 plus, yes, you are right, it's 14,000 plus, but it is way, way more than 14,000, way more, way more than that. Okay, so I will just show you. So this is what we had. Can you see this? We had 209,874 items from that large table. So we had 209,874 items from the large data sets. So 209,874, which is a function of all the columns or fields multiplied by all the rows. So all those columns multiplied by all those rows gave us 209874 from a single very large table. Now that we have drawn up a data model, let's find out what we have been able to reduce that to. So I'm going to start from the orders table. So on the orders table, we have one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven columns. So we have eleven columns and nine, 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 four rows. So you see that at the bottom of the page. So eleven columns and nine, 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 four rows. So eleven columns and nine, 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 four rows. This is what we have on the orders table, right? Then on product table, we have one, two, three, four, five columns and 1894 rows. So at the bottom, you see 1894 rows here. So on products, we have five columns and 1894 rows. Then we'll go to location. On location table, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six columns and 632 rows. So on location table, we have six columns and 632 rows. And finally, on customers table. So on customers table, we have one, two, three columns and 793 rows. So on customers, we have three columns and 793 rows. Okay, so multiply columns and rows. I will get equals to these, multiply by that. So this is the total items. And when I sum this all up, then I have 125,575 items, meaning that I've been able to reduce the items on this data by this amount. And that amounts to how many percent? 40%. So technically, I have optimized the efficiency somehow, somehow, by up to around 40%, which means 40% of the data we had here were redundant. 40% of the data were redundant because right now, despite eliminating all those 40% of data from the original data set, I can still do a reporting by anything I want. I can still report by all the fields without having issues. And that is the ultimate essence of building a Power BI data model. So one other reason why you need to have a data model is this. So if you are going to be doing any reporting that has to do with time intelligence. So for your time intelligence report, if you are writing any time intelligence DAX formulas, you will always be required to use date columns. And the best way for you to do that is to have a separate table called a calendar table. So now we'll see how do you build a calendar table 
with DAX in Power BI. So if I click on the modeling tab, you will see that we have three icons under the group of calculations. So these are the three places where you can basically write DAX formulas, use DAX functions within these three parameters. But in this case, we want to use DAX to generate a calendar table. So guess what we'll use? Is it new measure? Is it new column? Or is it new table? What are we going to use for that? Anybody? Quick, good guess. New column, new measure, or new table? New measure. Hmm. Somebody says new measure. I'm trying to generate a dimension table for calendar that will just have a list of dates. And I want to use DAX to do that. I'm not going to use new measure. I'm not going to use new column. I will use new table. New table because I need that function to help me create a table that has a list of dates. Okay, so I'm going to click on new table. Every DAX formula you write must always have a name. Whether you are writing on a new table, a new column, or a new measure. So in this case, I'm going to call this, I'll change this from table equals to, I will change this to calendar because I want to call my table a calendar table. So calendar equals to, now I need a DAX function that can help me automatically look at my data set in this Power BI file and give me a list of dates. And that function is calendar auto. So the calendar auto function. So one of the reasons why you need this is when you start writing DAX formulas, if you use any DAX function that requires a date argument, that function, that date argument required, we need you to put a date, a, we need you to supply a column that has uh, continuous dates, basically. So continuous dates meaning that the date column must not skip any dates. Now, if you think about it naturally, it is possible that within your transaction table where you have a date column, there are certain days where you don't have any single transaction. Or maybe there will be certain dates where you may not have a single transaction. But guess what? If you need to supply that column, your date column in any DAX function, Dates in DAX expect you to have continuous dates, but somehow they call it contiguous dates. I don't know what that means, but my translation of it is you need to have continuous dates, which means you must have a list of dates without skipping any dates. Okay, so that function I'm going to use is called calendar auto. So calendar auto is a function that will help me generate a list of dates automatically by looking at my data model. Now in DAX, which we are gonna treat next month, or in our next class, anytime you see a function that has square bracket as an argument, what that means is it is an optional argument. Optional in the sense that if I don't use this argument, if I don't supply this argument, so calendar auto wants me to supply fiscal year end month, if I don't use this argument and I just close my bracket, everything is expected to work fine. But what that argument actually wants is this. Now, when I use calendar auto, calendar auto will basically go into my data and give me a list of dates from 1st of January of the first dates in my data, of the first year in my data. So if my data starts from June, for example, when I use calendar auto, let's say June 2019 is my first data. And my last data is, let's say, January 2020. So my data spans from June 2019 to January 2020. When I use calendar auto, calendar auto will give me a list of dates from 1st January 2019 
to 31st December 2020. That is when I don't use this argument for fiscal year end month. So calendar auto will always give you a list of dates from the first day of the first year of a calendar of your table to the last day of the last year of your table. But if I supply an argument here, say 03 or 04, so 03 meaning that my year ends in March, right? So if my year ends in March, then I won't expect calendar auto to give me a list of dates from 1st January. Rather, it will give me a list of dates from 1st of April 2019 to 31st of March 2020. That is a complete year now. But I will just ignore this argument and close this bracket, press enter. So once I press enter, I would expect to have an additional table here on my fields pane for calendar. So I now I have a new table called calendar. And the first thing you should always try to do is, once you use calendar auto of whatever, or whatever function you use to generate your calendar table, to give you a list of dates, the first thing you should do is, you make sure you select that date column, and then on us, the modeling tab, you see a group for calendars and you have this button for markers calendar table. So you use that icon, click on this markers calendar table and you select that date column as your calendar table date column. So select these dates and click OK. So now anytime you are writing any function that requires a date argument, you would expect it to work smoothly, right? So if I come to my data view, I would see that on my calendar table, I have a list of dates. So this is just dates. But if I want to report by month, by year, by quarter or whatever, then I need to create extra columns. So I can click on new column here, and then I will try to create a column for month, year, and quarter. So I'm going to create a column for month equals to, I need a DAX function that will look at this column, look at the items on this column and just extract only the month for me, right? So that function is called format. So format. So I want to format something. What do I want to format? So I have two arguments on format, value and the format to apply. So I want to format this column for date and I want it to give me a particular format, right? So this date column is under my calendar table. So in DAX, you always type the name of the table first, and then you can easily see which column you want, right? So I want to format my calendar date, comma. The format I would like to give it is MMM format, MMM format, right? So MMM is text, which means I need to put it in quotes. So double quotes, I'll type MMM, double quotes, then close my bracket and press enter. So now I have a new column for month and that column is carrying a format of MMM. So MMM is gonna give me a short form of month. I need this because when I'm doing my reporting, what is the essence of having a full January if everybody understands that JAN stands for January. So it is always better for you to use this format because it will help you manage space better okay but if i wanted to use the full month all i need to do is make this m four m's so if i make this four and i hit enter then i'll have a full month of january right so i'll just keep three mmm then i need to create a new column for year and quarter so what i need to do is copy this whole formula ctrl c create a new column, paste that in, and just change this from month. I'll change this to year, then I'll change this format to Y, 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 Y. So this is the format that will give me year. Then I'll create an extra column for quarter, so new column. Paste, change this to quarter, Q U A R T R. Then I'll change this to Q. So Q is supposed to give me quarter. 
So when I hit enter, I should have Q1 to Q4. So I have one, two, three, and four, but maybe I want to keep it as Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 instead of this. This, this is a four slash QQ. Okay, so this is gonna give me Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. Then I have a calendar table. I need to go to my model view and create a link between this calendar and let's say on the order date. So if I want to create any reports on the orders based on dates, I can easily do that. So create this link between that order date and this calendar date. And always remember, first things first, you go to test this. So I'm gonna come back here to my model view and I mean my report view, control C, control V, copy and paste this. And this time around, I will replace category with month. So just to be sure if that connection is right. So once I replace with month, you can see that it is correctly reporting different figures for each month. But the only issue you now have now is that instead of having January as the first month, you have April as the first month. So this is a problem because Power BI now thinks that anytime you give it a text field, it always tries to arrange it alphabetically. It doesn't really understand that April is the fourth month and January is the first month, December is the last month. So we need to do something here. I'm gonna come back to my data view and I will try to add a new column that will be a helper to this my month column. So it's gonna help this month column such that anytime I pull this month column, let January always be first in that order, right? So I'll create a new column. And what I need now is a function that can tell me that this date is in month one. This date is in month one. Any date that is in February is in month two. Any date in June is month six. So I need to know that function. So I will just create a new column. I'll call this month number. And the function that will give me that is month. So month returns a number from one to 12 representing the month, okay? So month, open brackets, just one argument for date. Where is my date? My date is in my calendar table as calendar date. Then I'll close bracket, I'll hit enter. So now I have a new column for month number. And I need to tell Power BI that anytime I select this column, I want you to always sort it by the month number. So January will always come first and everything will always be in order. Everything will always be ordinary. So select this column. I'll make sure I'm on the modeling tab. Then I'll see this sort group and it says sort by column. I want to sort this column by which column? So I want to sort this month's column by, I'll click on this drop down. So I want to sort this month's column by the month number. So once that is done, if I return back to my report view, I will see that everything is now in order. So with this now, we have been able to build a Power BI data model. We have been able to tell what should go to our fact tables, what should go to our dimension tables, we use Power Query to build fact table and dimension tables. We create our relationships. And then we went a step further to create a calendar table just in case we need to write some time intelligence formulas or we need to write some DAX formulas that will require date arguments. So now that we have a proper data model, we have technically come to the end of this session I would just like to take a couple of questions. So anybody has questions? So would the recorded and previous one be made available for viewing after today? Yes, it will. So we'll make this available for viewing. Can I use the same steps if I have data from multiple sources? Okay, so this will take me to something else now. 
So in some cases, in structured uh, environments where you have a structured relational database or a data warehouse, this can already be done for you. So in most databases that are relational, you already have tables in this format. So you already have your tables separated by their function. So you have dimension tables and you have your fact tables. So in that case, all you need to do is have a connection to each of those tables, then come to Power BI and create your relationships. That is one. The second thing is this, if your data is coming from different sources, so you are saying that what's going to make up your fact table is going to come from different sources. In that case, what you need to do is, first you make sure that when you are in the query editor, you have combined everything that should make up your data. So the first step we did was in Power Query is, we replicated our single data source, we replicated it three times. So if your data is coming from different data sources, that is you are saying that what's gonna make up this fact table is going to come from multiple sources. Then make sure that you have it combined in a single query first, and that query that has the complete data is what you now replicate. So your first step is always to combine everything that makes up your data in query, then you replicate. I hope that answers your question. So are we going to make this data set available? Yes, immediately after this webinar, we'll post a link for this data set so you can try it on your own even before you see the video. Even before you are able to watch a replay, try this on your own. It's always better. I would advise that everyone should take a proper look at all the webinars we've taken from the beginning of this series. So starting from an introduction to Power BI Desktop, then we went on to data preparation. Now we have done data modeling. And in next class, we are going to be talking about DAX formulas. So thank you very much and hope to see you again next time.